if you don't know how your concrete works when you're making it, the, the, the ultimate question is how can you make a high quality product that's going to satisfy your customers, not just in the short term but in the long term. And so this webinar is really going to explore how all these ingredients come together so that you can achieve that high quality product that, you're, that you desire and that your clients are demanding. To begin with, we're going to talk about the primary ingredients, the main components of concrete. That's the cement, the water, and the aggregates. And these make up the bulk of what we know of as concrete. And if you're familiar with construction grade concrete, this is pretty much what all construction grade concrete is. It just has the cement, water, and coarse and fine aggregates. There are also secondary ingredients that are important. And uh, those of us who make concrete countertops, we routinely or almost consistently use secondary ingredients, which include pozzolans, pigments, fibers, admixtures, and there are others, but we're going to focus on these four. Selecting all your ingredients really is an important step in designing your mix. And these have all sorts of influences on the strength, cure time, aesthetics, durability, and, 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 all, and, and other factors. So it's not just picking uh, materials that are inexpensive or easy to obtain, there's lots of other factors that go into um, choosing the materials that, that are going to give you the best that you can get out of your concrete. So let's focus and start on the primary ingredients. Uh, these are your, uh, your aggregates, which are largely a structural filler. They play an important role, which I'll get to. Um, and all the aggregates, the sand and the rocks and, and, and whatnot, are bound together by a binder which is your cement paste made up of cement and water. So let's start with the aggregates. And aggregates can include sands, uh, both natural and manufactured sands, uh, crushed aggregates, natural stones, and recycled aggregates. And like I said, these make up the bulk of the concrete volume. And they strongly influence the workability of the mix. And that's derived largely by the gradation, which is important. And I'll get to that in, in, in a little while. So when we're talking about workability and how aggregates influence workability, we have to look at um, not just uh, the type of material, but the shape of the material, the shape of the particles. Are they round? Are they rough? Uh, are they very angular? How well do they pack together? And are they coarse or are they fine? Because fine aggregates, finer particles, have much more surface area. And surface area really dominates workability, especially when we start talking about our sand. For concrete countertops, most of the time we're making thin sections of concrete, often an inch and a half or two inches thick. And because of that, we have to limit the size of the particles to be about three-eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters or smaller. It's very rare uh, to, to, to need anything bigger, and we don't want to be using half-inch or three-quarter inch stone like you would in conventional concrete, simply because it would act as a weak particle rather than making it strong. It's just too big for such thin sections of concrete. Um, in the pictures here, I show on the left uh, ball bearings. Now, we would never use ball bearings, but it illustrates a point that very smooth, rounded particles really have very little interparticle friction. They roll around each other, and smoother particles boost our workability. If your mix, however, is based on a, a crushed stone where it's a manufactured product. You can see in this photo the, the particles are very angular and sharp, and they, they really pack together well. The particles knit together, and because of that, we get higher strengths. On the other hand, the downside is we lose workability. So if you're struggling with your mix and, you, and it's just hard to make a really workable mix and you know you're using crushed aggregate, the reason is the particles are knitting together very efficiently, and that's a, that's a potential limitation of working with uh, and crushed stone. Focusing on our fine aggregates, these are the sands. And, and sands can be manufactured, they can be crushed, uh, or they're, they're, they could be natural. And sands, because they have such a high surface area, have a great degree of influence on the workability of, of your concrete. Um, more surface area means we need more cement paste to coat all those particles and let them move around. And that also can influence the way um, you may consider adding water to your mix. And I'm going to get into that later when we talk about water. Um, just like coarse aggregates, fine aggregates are graded. So coarser sands 
and if we talk about screen sizes, number 8, number 16, number 30, a number 8 screen is about 2 millimeters, or roughly a sixteenth of an inch in size. Uh, we talk about number 30 sieve, which is a little bit finer. We're getting to be like, like a coarse salt, or a medium, or, or a salt size particle. When we get down to the really fine sands, sugar size sands, or even powder, that's where we can start to begin to see some, some issues. Fine sands tend to trap a lot of air in your concrete. The air particles, the air bubbles, just can't push their way through the fine sand. And so our mixes tend to have a lot more air bubbles entrained in, and trapped in them because the, the excessive fines hold that air bubbles, those air bubbles uh, in the concrete. Um, it's sometimes said that if you have a concrete mix that has a lot of excessive fines, uh, you're going to be making weaker concrete. And the, one of the reasons for this is concrete that has excessive fine material in it tends to have it be very stiff. It's, it's very hard to get a good workable concrete. And so the, 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 the tendency is that the, for, for uh, someone making that concrete to want to add water to it to increase the workability. Because when you add water, you're actually increasing your paste content. And again, I'll get when I talk about water, I'll talk about the negative effects of that. But if you have a, 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 lot, a lot of fine sand in your mix, you can um, have, have that, that tendency to, to want to add more water. So uh, that's, that's something we want to avoid. I keep mentioning aggregate gradation. And if you just think about it, it's, it's a description of the particle sizes big stuff, medium-sized stuff, and little-sized stuff. And that's a very crude description of it. Um, but there are three basic types of gradation. On the left, we have well-graded aggregates. And that's sort of the, the idea of filling as much of the space in the concrete with stone and sand, so very solid, inert particles. And well-graded mixes use very little cement paste. Um, they tend to be more, very stable, very strong. Um, but one of the challenges with, with well-graded mixes is it's very hard to find all those different sizes you need and knowing how to proportion how much big stuff, how much medium-sized stuff, how much little stuff. It's, it's kind of science in, a, in and of itself. Poorly graded aggregates, you can think of those as the ball bearings. They're all the same size. And these kind of mixes are really easy. It's like using nothing but gravel or nothing but one size sand. Uh, they tend to use a lot of need a lot of cement paste to fill all those voids in between the particles, uh, which are which are empty, and uh, and that tends to lead to more shrinkage issues. Uh, poorly graded mixes tend to be a little bit more workable, um, but again, that depends on the shape. A compromise between the two are gap graded aggregates, and that's really where most concretes fall. You may have uh, a natural uh, pea gravel, let's say, that has a variety of sizes, and then that's blended with, uh, say, an all-purpose masonry sand, which, again, has a variety of sizes in it, but there's no continuous gradation between big and small. You can clearly see big and clearly see small. And these are where most, most concretes fall in. M many aggregates that are used are natural. So you might have a bank-run stone or crushed rock. Some folks who want to make their concrete more environmentally green uh, choose to replace some or all of their aggregates with recycled aggregates. And this is just a list of some different types of recycled materials that are used. Uh, crushed bottles are a very uh, common way to make it very obviously green. And it's possible to replace some of your coarse aggregate or all of your coarse aggregate or some of your fine aggregate or all of your aggregates, both fine and coarse, with recycled aggregates. And that has a prof profound effect on the recycled content of your concrete. Now, how does this influence um, the workability of your mix? Well, if you want to make a stiff mix, let's say you're going to be packing that concrete and you want to put in veins, make a variegated or hand-pressed look, you're going to want to have a very stiff clay-like mix, as, as you can see in the picture. And those tend to be best made with, a, with an all-sand mix, because the, the fine sand doesn't give you a chunky look. You, you have a nice creamy consistency, whereas if it had gravel in it, it would be more rocky and difficult to get the texture you wanted. Um, because it's stiff, it's going to uh, trap whatever air is mixed in the concrete. And so when you grind it to expose that 
you know, expose the ingredients, you're going to see pinholes. And that's a characteristic of a stiff mix, is it always, always will have pinholes and voids at the surface and in the concrete. So these are mixes that are designed to be this way, and that's a natural characteristic of them. The complete opposite of that type of mix is a fluid mix, where you pour it and you want to maybe perhaps vibrate it and get a very intricate casting. You might consider it uh, a perfect pop a perfect slab or, or or an as cast finish where it comes out of a perfect mold and there are no pinholes and these types of mixes are uh, usually a gap graded or a fairly well graded mix that has agar in it because they're they're best they're the best type of mixes to get high fluidity and high workability and be, when you have a fluid mix air can push its way out of the concrete on its own and that's how you get that really good high quality finish So the first primary ingredient that we talked about was, was aggregate. The second is cement. Now cement is essentially the, dr the dry component of the glue that holds everything together. And this is really one of the key ingredients of your concrete. Um, we're going to be focusing on Portland cement, but there are other types of cement that, that are used in, in architectural concrete, decorative concrete, and, and concrete countertops and speci specifically. Uh, in the United States, there are, there are many types of cement. The main three types that are used are 1, 2, and 3. Uh, type 1 is normal. Uh, type 2 is a moderate sulfate resistant, which is essentially the same as um, type 1. And type 3, oh, my computer is messing up on me. Uh, and type 3 is a high early strength. So what's normally used is ordinary type con one concrete, and that comes in white or gray. And if you wanted a higher early strength concrete that, that sets a little faster, gives you higher early strengths sooner, which is always desirable, uh, that also comes in white or gray. Now I had mentioned that there are different types of cement. An another type of cement that's used is a, a calcium sulfa aluminate cement. These are rapid setting cements. Uh, they achieve essentially 28 day strengths in 24 hours. Um, they have a different cement chemistry and they have different rules. So like I said, we're going to be focusing on Portland cement, uh, which is the most common. Um, when you deal with Portland cements, you, it's important to realize that different brands of, of Portland cement have subtle differences, the differences in fineness of grind, which may result in different set times. Um, one brand of gray cement may be a completely different color, maybe a dark gray, whereas a different brand might be a, a greenish beigey gray. So that has an influence on your colors and it's something to be aware of. The third in primary ingredient of concrete, which again makes up the bulk of the, 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 the volume of your concrete, is water. And that's the most important ingredient because it has such a dominant effect on so many characteristics of your concrete. The rule of thumb is to use the, as little water as possible when you make the concrete and as much, possible, as much water as possible after it's hard when you're curing it. So use it sparingly when you're designing your mix. Plan on using less. When you're making the concrete, measure it out very precisely and use it liberally when you're curing it. Keep the concrete wet. This characteristic of, or this, this want and this tendency to add water to increase your workability is perhaps the number one reason why there are so many problems with concrete. Water has such a profound influence on so many different factors of your concrete, not just strength, but uh, color and appearance and porosity. It's, it should never be used like a seasoning just to add water to achieve a certain oatmeal-like characteristic or a, a mushy characteristic. It's, it, it's such an important uh, ingredient that, uh, that it needs to be uh, dosed carefully. And here's a good example that helps you understand that. For instance, I want to have, make a glass of grape Kool-Aid. So I have one packet of dry Kool-Aid powder, and I add it to the glass, and I follow the instructions. I add water to the glass and mix it up. Now, you want some, but I only have one packet of Kool-Aid. So I take your glass, empty half of what I have into your glass, and then fill both glasses with water to now fill both glasses. And what I've done is I've made more Kool-Aid, but it's very obvious to see that what I've done is I've diluted it. So now if you tasted it, it's going to taste weaker, and the color is going to be lighter. And if we kept adding more water, it would get lighter and lighter and more and more dilute. And that has, that's a, a direct description of what happens with concrete when you just simply add more water. It, it dilutes the glue that holds everything together. 
And if you stand there with a hose adding water to your mixer, you have no idea how far you're diluting it. So you really don't know what kind of concrete you're making. If you think about the, the Kool-Aid powder as your cement, and the water is the water, of course, um, the ratio of the water to cement is the descriptive characteristic that we're, we're, we're talking about here. And one, this ratio of pounds of water for, or kilograms of water to pounds or kilograms of cement in your concrete is known as the water-cement ratio. And it's sort of the descriptive uh, number that you can use to, to gauge the quality of your concrete. And it is basically how you can determine whether your concrete is going to be good or not. Um, the, the lower the water-cement ratio, the less water you use per, relative to your cement, the stronger the concrete is going to be, the richer the colors, and the more water you add, the more you dilute it. Um, because cement particles are actual physical particles, they're not, they don't dissolve like sugar in water, we have to look at how do those particles react and how does this relate to Kool-Aid at all. So with very low water cement ratios, lots of cement, very little water, the particles in that water mixture are very close together. And why that's important, why that's desirable, is that as those particles react with water, you know, we're starting a chemical reaction when we add water and cement together. Those particles are growing calcium silicate hydrate crystals. So these crystals are what really are holding everything together. They are the concrete, the, the cement that glues everything together to form the concrete. And the closer those particles are together, the faster they start setting up. And because the particle spacing is close, the crystals form soon and they grow strong and the space between the particles is small, so there's not a whole lot of water trapped in between, so this, the porosity of the concrete is low. The more water that's added, the farther those particles are, are, are separated, so the, the crystals that have to form to bridge it all together, it takes longer for that to happen, so the set time is longer. But because it, those are long, slender, fragile crystals, the concrete is weaker, and there's a lot more space in between, so the concrete's more porous. And that's, a dis that's what you get when, when you have concrete that has a high water cement ratio. Um, when we're making concrete countertop concrete, that would be anything above a 0.45. In conventional construction concrete, that would be considered quite low. But for us, because we need such a high quality concrete, that's considered very high. Again, the moral of the story is more water is bad. Now, once our concrete does set, once it turns from a fluid to a, a solid, things change. Now we have to think of our cement particles as little seeds. When you plant a seed in the ground, to make it grow you have to add water and then you have to keep it wet because if that, that plant starts growing and then it suddenly dies out, that's it, the plant dies. It's never going to get any, any bigger. If our concrete dries out, the cement particles stop, they don't have any water, they stop hydrating, so whatever strength we had when it dried out, that's it. Um, Curing is the process of maintaining the internal moisture of our concrete. The longer it stays wet, the stronger it's going to be. The longer it stays wet, the richer that color is going to be. So that's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance of how long do we, we cure. Typically, concrete is wet cured for roughly seven days before it starts to dry out. Now that doesn't mean we're not working on it in that time, but it's, it's not like it has to be wet under plastic for 28 days. Our concrete that we're making can start to dry out, start that drying process a lot sooner because it gains a lot higher strength earlier on. 